This is Craig Collin, and you're watching the Orlando Real Podcast. In today's episode, I'm talking to Craig Collin. He's the president of the Tavistock Development Company. If you don't know what that is, they're over Lake Nona and Sunbridge, and a lot of the fabric of the growth that's happening here in Orlando. I hope you enjoy the interview. Craig, thanks for joining us. Good to see you, Ken. Man, so t- what, what is Tavistock? Sure. Um, so Tavistock is a diversified real estate development company. And so for what that really is, is we do a lot of different things. Diversified meaning there's not an asset class that we don't touch. Um, If you think about it, we're a multifamily apartment developer, we're an office developer. Uh, We do a lot of residential for sale, for rent, as I said, we have a hotel portfolio. Uh, And then there are a lot of other businesses that a development company that wouldn't normally get into that we get into. So fiber optics homeowners insurance, lots of different things. And then um, that's how we're known locally in Orlando or in central Florida is really being Tavistock development company. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then we're, we're um, owned and I work for a private family that has been the Lewis family that has been in Orlando for 50 some years. Um, They're known for other things. We also have some golf courses and Usually when I'm trying to explain to people what we do, that, you know, it just, I forget a lot of stuff, but, <laughs> um, but primarily we're a big um, community developer, yeah. right? Um, and that, and that's what we're known for here and known for quite frankly, now nationally and really known for it internationally for some of the stuff that we're doing in central Florida. It's so cool. I, so if, if you're watching and they don't know Tavistock, you guys have your big two marquee ones here, I would say, are Lake Nona and Sunbridge. And most people might think, oh, well, maybe Tavistock owns the office buildings, or maybe they just, they own the land, but they sold it. But you guys own a lot of it. Yeah. So it's interesting. You know, my, I've been with Tavistock for seven years. And uh, what I came from was a public development, a uh, public developer. Yeah. And in my career, I probably have built somewhere around 35,000 homes. <laughs> And I'm going to say probably been involved in 2,000 communities. Wow. Um, and all of those were transaction, right? Uh, working for a public company. Coming to work for a private family, it's very different. Most of our portfolio, if you think about Lake Nona and Sunbridge, the overwhelming part of our portfolio is a long-term ownership, mm. right? So when we build a hotel, when we build a multifamily, when we're doing a residential neighborhood, when we're doing office, when we're doing industrial, typically it's a long-term hold. Um That's not everything we do. I mean, we do, you know, uh, for those, you know, the listeners and watchers in Central Florida, they think of us here, but we also own uh, and are developing Pier 66 in Fort Lauderdale. That's a billion dollar phase one project. We own a marina in Boston. We uh, own a hotel in Boston. We have a a chain of restaurants on the Eastern seaboard. So um, we own a hotel in Atlanta, Charlotte, Cleveland. Uh, But here um, we do uh, the two big communities and it's absolutely a long-term hold, which makes us as a developer think of it very differently yeah right you're not trying to get in get out we are not trying to get in get out we are looking for the long-term value for our residents and for our tenants um for the people that choose to go to school here the people that choose to call this home uh and the people that choose to you know have their offices or, or come to work and and that's a when you're doing that as a developer it's a very very different um it's a different practice Mm. right It, it makes you think about things like architecture design street layout, trails, artwork, Hmm. all of those things go into it. Social connectivity, all of those things go into being a developer when you're thinking much more long-term. And it's like, it's not a soulless development either. It's not row homes on top of everything. I mean, you guys are, when you talk about you're into everything, I mean, it's interconnectivity, the restaurants, like you guys own so much. And it's so how did that start? Like, I mean, it was obviously I th- the story goes, Joe was flying over the area. I was like, I'll take that. Uh, but how do you go from like, I've got all this land, which is like, just like known alone is 17 square miles. That's yeah. 17 square miles in the city of Orlando. That's sure. Insane. How do you go from there to where we are today? Um, so, uh, you know, like, uh, I forget what the phrase is, but you know, my success rests on the shoulders of people before me. Sure. Um, and so how it really started was a large tract of land that the Lewis family bought with Lake Nona country club. Mm-hmm. And so c- with that came a large land to the South of the country club down Narcusi. I wasn't here at the time, but everyone who has been here for a long time says, well, Narcusi was just a seven eleven. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> um, and then, uh, it was held for a little while. There was more la- land added to it. 
uh, in the downturn, so uh, if you think about this, I w- I've been in, in real estate development since 1993 when I'm, uh, I'm originally from Toronto when I moved to the United States. Um, so in the downturn in 08, when nothing was going on, um, they started a place called San, uh, um, Sanford Burnham, mm. right? So there was uh, the Governor Bush was, it was in place, the Lewis family was involved, and they ended up starting what was Sanford Bur- Burnham, who's left now, but now UCF has taken over that as their cancer center. Um, so they started developing it, and then people called it Medical City. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, here comes the Moors, and then here comes the VA. Um, then I think what happened is um, at a, a pivotal moment in time was so the the fellow that um, really was integral to it was a fellow named Jim Zaboro, who's a very very good friend and one of the most brilliant people I found in real estate development. Um, then what they decided, instead of selling bulk parcels off to residential developers, they were going to create the community. They were going to develop lots. And so what people really think of Lake Nona now is, is Laureate Park and, yeah. and that and that neo-traditional community. And it was really the foresight of, of thinking about it differently. There's a fellow named Rob Adams who I think, you know, it's hard for me to say because I'm a really good residential guy, <laughs> but he's better than me. I mean, he's really, really talented. And... Um, and so that, that's kind of how it started. Then the restaurants came. And then, quite frankly, the Lewis family, you know, Mr. Lewis and the family are very, very good at understanding what's coming, mm. right? Lots of people in life are really good at understanding what's hot and I'm going to take advantage of it now. Sure. They've been exceptional at understanding what's going to be. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, that's when the hotels came. That's when the restaurants came. And they came early. And now when people go out there... Um, I remember, you know, it's the funny thing. We have a container park out there, Boxy. And I remember being in our office looking over and we were looking at an empty parking lot and we said, hey, we should put a container park there. And I remember the funny story. We're like, no one will come. And we're like, we think people will come. (laughs) And so then we put it in. It's been incredibly successful. People love it. Um, The city loves it, right? And uh, and now they're they're popping up everywhere. Not that we were the first, but I think it's that foresight. And now, so that you, you pull that forward to today, we're anywhere between 24 or 28,000 people live in the 17 square miles. Yeah. Um, well, one of the reasons I came, if you think about it, you know, when I left a public uh, builder, I was the president for New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. I was very happy in my sure. job. <laughs> I, my wife was very happy living there. And I still, <laughs> I, we still have a place in Manhattan, but she was very, we, were, we had a really good life. And right. then I came to Lake Nona and I kind of turned around and I said, I'm never in my career as a developer going to have the opportunity to be involved in a place like this yeah. um, and, and be part of, of the journey of, of what Lake Nona is and now Sunbridge as well. It's Sorry, a long-winded answer. No, I love that. I love that. I think it's interesting because so many people, you, you got, especially we, I live in an online space and so there's so many people that will complain. And I think if you really slow down and like really understand what Lake Nona is and what it is, how different it is compared to a lot of other things we have in Central Florida, it's remarkable. I remember, I think it was a Henry Ford quote where he said, if, uh, if I gave people what they wanted, I would have, they would give them a yeah, faster horse, a faster horse. Right. And so like, <laughs> how do you, how do you look at the, you know, do you take community feedback as something you want to add? Or, I mean, when you're thinking about the future and like what we actually need, how, what's the thought process behind sure. all that? Sure. Yeah. So we do a community survey every year uh, and we take it very, very seriously. And that, and when I say take it seriously, it might be uh, comments on traffic. You know, one of the things we're a bit of a victim of our own success. Sure. Where, um, you know, so there, there's a group of, you know, on, on our team that's really focused on trying to understand infrastructure and how we get ahead of it. But we actually survey all our residents every year and we take it to heart and it might be infrastructure, it might be trails. Um, it might be target, you know, <laughs> like we were <laughs> finally you know, targets it's coming. Long, it's, it's a long journey. Uh, <laughs> but you know, we, we kept hearing that, like we actually survey our residents and say, what stores do you want? Yeah. Right. What kind of food do you want? Uh, target was always on the list and it took, you know, uh, I like to think I was involved in it for my seven years, but I think it was a 13 year journey. <laughs> and, uh, you know, someone texted me last night. So it's a big target. So it says like 150,000 square feet. It was the large on Cornet. It was the largest retail transaction in Q2 in the United States. What? Yeah. Yeah. The largest. That's so crazy. It's crazy. Right. So we survey them. We listen to them. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I live there. Yep. Right. So the good news is, you know, I'm around and people <laughs> stop me and they talk to me about stuff, which is great. Right. You know, um, maybe more now. Yeah. But, um, you know, I love talking to people. You know, I love what I do. And if I can make it better for everyone, you know, that's that's a big part of why I do what I do. Yeah. So. 
So Sunbridge, it's not too far from Lake Nona. It's, sure. it's technically obviously St. Cloud for the most of it, although there's some Orange County contingent of as yep. well, uh, which I want to dive into later. But how is that different? Like if everybody knows what Lake Nona looks like, how is Sunbridge different? Sure. So when Lake Nona, when the Lewis family bought most of Lake Nona, not all of Lake Nona, it was pretty much masqueraded, right? Um, and so Sunbridge, in our partnership with the Church of Latter-day Saints, who owns, you know, roughly about 330, 350,000 acres, roughly. They're, I think they're the largest land. I think they're the pro- largest private, probably, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, who are great, great partners. Um, they're they're um, true stewards of the land, and that is great when you're dealing with an asset like Sunbridge. So, uh, as you know, Clint, uh, Clint Beatty, who runs yeah. it, who's, who's just a brilliant man, um, and really, really focused on protecting the assets there, uh, the physical assets, mm. the trees, the, and, uh, and the lakes. I mean, there are three lakes on the property. It's very different in the sense that we're trying to connect people to nature mm. at a very, very deep and intimate level. And that's, that's, that's easy. Like most developers will say, oh, I'm going to protect the land. But you guys actually, you spend a lot of money doing this, right, to, to protect it. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So, um, we, we do. So one of the things we've done is create, created a nonprofit, right? We have a naturalist. I mean, I don't know if there's a developer in the country that, that has a naturalist on staff, right? right? right. Um, we work with the, the school that just started out there, the Osceola County School that just started out there and integrated them into our, our program. Um, the real key, what we wanted to do, and I say this as a, a, a you know three-decade developer, we wanted to have people within 15 minutes to be immersed in nature, that's not a park. Mm-hmm. That's not a tree. That is going out there and having, you grew up in Michigan, I right? Did, yeah. And, you know, I grew up in Canada. Yep. And so I had the opportunity as a child to be able to, not too far, um, be really immersed in nature and see it. And I think we have a great opportunity to do that at Sunridge. And so we're, we're, we feel we're stewards of the land. Um, it is a development, right? We are yeah. bringing businesses. We are bringing people there. But I think we have a very unique opportunity um, to have give people that access to nature. Um, I don't know if, if you've been out to the middle. If you haven't, I'll oh, yeah. take you. All right. right? <laughs> but it'll blow your mind. <laughs> like, you know, it'll blow your mind. Just these, these live oaks, the canopies. And uh, if you go out there, no matter what you do for a living, you look at that and say, you got to protect it. Well, that's I, like I'm sick of so like we obviously sell a lot of real estate and yet like I'm very tired of the soulless neighborhoods and people are like yeah. where's the trees and where's the yeah. nature and like that's why they love a, like a winter park where it feels like you've got these t- trees that have been there for a hundred years yeah. and like right so you guys are going to be able to take advantage of that and actually make it feel that way in some sense in a brand new neighborhood which is I don't know that's been done at least here yeah yeah I think so I think you're right you know I I kind of look at it when uh, Lake Nona is different Sunbridge is different and I think there are many other successful you know big master plan communities sure you know during COVID what was interesting there was almost a flight to the master plan community people didn't know what was going to happen so they went to big communities and we had we saw such an in migration to the southern states especially this area Um, and when people came you know, what I said to our team was there, I think there are three things that we need to look at as developers. And you could think of it in Lake Nona, you know, and, and, and Sunbridge, very different, you know, settings. Mm-hmm. But I said, there's the physical manifestation. There are the buildings, there are the houses, there are things like that. Then I think there is the, the programming. Like, what are we going to do with it, right? Mm-hmm. So if we went out to Sunbridge and we said, oh, you know, look at those pretty lakes, you know, but you can't touch them, right? <laughs> or, or, or look at that, look at that. I mean, the, the developers, let me get a bad name for this. We've preserved all this land, but you can't see it. You, can't, you don't know where right. it is. It's conservation. It's but conservation. Don't go back no, there. Don't go back yeah. there, right? <laughs> and so, um, so there's the programming. It's like, how do you engage mm-hmm. on, on all different levels? And then I think it's the connectivity, right? Yeah. So that the connectivity with not just the residents, but organizations in, in and around um, the schools, all of that stuff. That's what makes the any community, any yeah. community special. We leverage what Lake Nona is around technology and innovation and the medical city and things like that. And then we definitely leverage what we what we have as assets, natural assets at Sunbridge. What do you feel like you've learned in Lake Nona that you'll be putting over in Sunbridge? Um, you know, probably, you know, the good news is being a developer of a large scale master master plan community, you make a lot of mistakes. Sure. Right. And so I think we've learned um, something on the residential um, housing uh, in terms of the variation that we need to provide. Mm. I think, you know, one of the things 
when I got um, to Florida in 2017, I felt a lot of the houses were starting to get bigger, 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 yeah. bigger, bigger. And I think it got worse during COVID because all of a sudden you had this, you know, money that was in migrating. So people from Connecticut were like, oh my gosh, I could afford, yeah. you know, this is great. <laughs> right, yeah. And then we were pushing out people that were local. And I think one of the big lessons we learned at Lake Nona at that point, and then we started to learn, and we took to Sunbridge, was diversity of product. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm a big believer in letting people choose and, and, and balance what they want. Like, don't like give them maybe uh, denser, smaller homes, but it's in the right school district. Let people make the choices that they want. That's one lesson I think we've taken there. I think we've also taken some lessons that, um, you know, it's a very na natural landscape. It's low irrigation. So we've learned some lessons mm -hmm. about long-term maintenance in Lake Nona that we could take to Sunridge and kind of start it anew. Yeah. Um, we, yeah, so those are a couple of things that I look at and say, if I, if I look at Sunbridge today, now I will say we've, we've taken a lot of lessons learned from the beginning, like the info center, mm -hmm. um, which is base camp, which yeah. is, you know, so we've taken a lot of lessons from, from Lake Nona and said, Hey, we should really, you know, use them here. And I think that's, that's benefited, benefited, um, our early success. Keep in mind, we really opened Sunbridge in COVID. No, I know. Right. It's, and it's, it's growing quick. Like we've yeah. sold a ton of houses there and it's wild to see. Um, I look at Basecamp, which you guys call it like your sales center. It's like your branding. Your guys team is fantastic, by the yeah. way. Yeah. I mean, that way that like, hey, if this is going to be the naturehood, then why not talk about it as if we're going on a trek together? And like we're here at Basecamp. It's very cool. Yeah. Let's, to be clear, when they told me we we're going to put yurts up, I, I looked yeah, at yeah. it and I was like, yurts. <laughs> yurts. But uh, yeah, it's worked it out fits. really well. Yeah, it fits. It fits really well. And yeah. the kids love it. And, you know, we'll do a, we'll do a, like a, a weekend event there and we'll get a thousand people. Wow. We don't have a, you know, we probably have that now. I think we have about mm, 15, 1600 people there now yeah. or, or homes uh, about that because uh, we, we own the uh, fiber optic company. So I actually saw the other day how many customers we have okay. out there. <laughs> Maybe it's 1100, 1200 now, but um, yeah. I so. can use my phone out there now. Yeah. The thing is that was, that was a big one. It's right. like, Hey, we need to get a cell tower out here. Yeah. It's you, it's pretty hard to convince. Well, actually it's a real funny thing. So, you know, Tavistock does a lot of different things. Yeah. We sometimes have to do them out of necessity. Sure. Right. So when Lake Nona was started, people didn't want to run internet out there and, uh, the big companies, cause they're sure. like, well, who's going to live out here? So the company then, not me, but decided to run one gig of fiber. So every hotel room, every office, every home has one gig of fiber. When we went out, went out to Sunbridge and we built the cell towers, <laughs> when we went out to Sunbridge, we built a cell tower. You've done we, it before. So you guys learned. Before, yeah. And we ran fiber. And so, you know, there's two gig of fiber to every home that it's expandable to 10 gig. And, um, but you can get a cell signal and, you know, it, it was super beneficial in during COVID because everybody went home. Oh yeah. Right. And then everyone could work and high speed internet. So that's been beneficial. Love that. Yeah. So you guys are investing a ton of money here in the central Florida area. And like you mentioned, we're, you're, you're known internationally for your work here. Why Orlando? Like what, what is it that what, where, why are you so bullish on Orlando? Sure. I mean, I, I would say, I'd be remiss to say that the Lewis family doesn't have long ties here, right? Sure. But, you know, me personally, when I look at who's moving to Florida, right, I would, I'm incredibly, so my career, uh, you know, for up until 2017, while it was the Eastern Seaboard, a lot of it was the Northeast, but I kind of had a, a, a national look and what my role was. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really bullish on Florida for a number of reasons, but and one of the things is the people coming to Florida, right? Mm -hmm. So it's funny. I got obviously I, I, with my place in New York. I have a lot of friends in New York. Um, I think um, I, I think people have this idea that the in migration is sixty five and older. Sure. And who's coming to Florida? And you know it is because they're your customer, yeah, and yeah. I see it every day. Is you know they're in their thirties. They're educated. Um, you know, they're healthy. They, they, um, they have great jobs, whether they're working here, moving with the company or working remote, that's who's coming yeah. and they're coming from all over. Right. So I'm bullish for that reason of who's coming. And I'm also bullish because of the diversity of thoughts mm -hmm. and the diversity of people in this, in this area. It's very cool. I think it's like, look at the food. Um, look at, you know, I'm big foodie, you know, mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time in New York, so yeah. I, I enjoy it, but the food offerings that we have and how they're growing. And, you know, I'm fortunate to sit on, um, uh, uh, United Arts of Central Florida on their board and the art, 
program, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's exceptional. Yeah. And so you and I chat about it all the time. It's like, I think we, it's a bit of a secret right now I to a lot of the country. I agree. I totally agree. I feel like, um, so we went to, we, we did this trip to Nashville. I've been yeah. talking about it a lot lately because it's, it opened my mind up and it was cool because people from your company came from the city, the County, like, like 40 leaders from Orlando came and somehow I snuck in. And, um, <laughs> and, they, and one of the things they talked about was like, you got to make it an amazing place to live first jobs come almost secondarily, but it is kind of like this yin and yang. You're constantly trying to like bolster those two things up at the same time. And then there's some other code stuff, which maybe we'll dive into next, but how do you, how do you feel like Orlando's doing that? I feel like if we're creating a cool place to live, then next is jobs. How do we go get more like high paying jobs for those 30 somethings that might not want to work from home that they want to work for sure. maybe bigger corporations or just like having more opportunity there? Yeah. Nashville is a great one to, I mean, I, so I had a daughter, I have twin girls that one of them went to, Na went, went to university in Nashville yeah. and, um, so, and she just graduated last May. So I got to spend a lot of time in Nashville, yeah. you know, and it's funny because I think when you look at, when you look at Nashville as an example, uh, there's Broadway, mm -hmm. right? And so some people will associate it with, um, you know, bachelorette parties yeah. and like the open air buses yeah. and those four blocks that are just, you know, like, on you know, crazy. Yeah. But um, I also think they've been able to also sell other things around that, you right. know, their food, um, you know, the food, the foodie network there is great. Uh, music, obviously education. So you start to think about those things and like, okay, we got it. We got yeah, it. We yeah, got we're it. on to something. Yeah. I think part of it is we've got a, the 800 pound gorilla, which is Disney, which is incredibly successful sure. for us. <laughs> we're both big fans. Right, exactly. Uh, and I think it's overcoming a little bit of the stigma. I think though, it's, it's leveraging the assets that are growing. Keep in mind that we have I think today I could probably, it's probably the busiest airport in the United States. Yeah. And that's people leaving the airport, not Atlanta or Chicago where you're just changing planes. Um, you know, with the terminal C up and running and plans for D. Yeah. Right. I mean, you're going to have so many people come into this city um, that I think it's, it's opportune. And, and I, if I back to the United arts thing, I look at an organization like that and like, they are doing the work mm. that this city will prosper for, for years and years to come. Yeah. And I think we're part of that. And I think you're part of that. Mm. Um, but I also think too, it's, you know, more young people, right. Getting that energy around it, yeah. becoming the place that you want um, you, you want to come to because you can want to afford it mm -hmm. to they, it's an interesting nightlife and, and food and all of that stuff. Um, uh, but you got to afford it. Right. So yeah. Austin's a very good example where they had that, but now people are leaving. It's unaffordable. It's unaffordable. And so I think we need to be careful of that yeah. in terms of, um, being able to get a younger generation here. And, and, um, we have a lot of stuff going for us. I mean, the one thing that I think is a bit of a challenge and we deal with it you know, up and even last week is, you know, climate, you know, it's not a political statement. Sure. It's just what's going on with the climate. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Hurricanes but, are not our yeah, friend right now. Yeah. And so I, I think, you know, we have to deal with that. And I think central Florida, you know, a little selfishly, I think central Florida benefits a little bit from our location. And I think that will help us too. So, yeah, I totally agree. And, and so I don't want, without leaving the jobs thing yeah, too, yeah. too quick, do you feel like it's, do we need HQ two here and huge jobs, or is it like the 20, 20 person company that grows to a hundred and like, should we just, or do we need to cater to both? I, I mean, I guess the easy answer is probably both. Yeah. Uh, I think, um, the large corporations that come in and listen, we've been able to attract a number of large mm -hmm. organizations to Lake Nona. I think they're very good. They also bring, you know, when you bring these large corporations in, they bring in the other, like, you know, it's like the whale shark with the, the little, little fish. fish that go with it. Yeah, that's so right. they bring those and those are typically, um, those are typically, you know, the, the smaller companies, you know, one thing to think about too, and we've chatted about this is um, like, we're starting to think about, what does office space look like now? And sure, it, you have very traditional class A office, sure. right? But you know what? Office space is going to start looking like warehouse space. I think so. Right? It's like starter or maker spaces, right? Yep. And uh, we have a little bit of that in Lake Nona. And now we're starting to think, okay, that's what it should look like. Yeah. Um, we have the incubator, you know, that we have there. A lot of those companies have like found, have, have decided to stay and live there and found their business there. Yeah. Um, so I, I think... We love to have these big companies come in, but I think 
really the long-term solution is is getting young people to stay to ground ground their family here yep. um and then grow their business here totally yeah. agree yeah i love that answer yeah. that's so cool this episode is brought to you by the posa group real estate agents my real estate team here in orlando check us out over on google we've got over 1200 five-star reviews and if you're looking to sell or buy a house anywhere in central florida we want to be your real estate resource of choice make sure you reach out to the orlandoreal.com slash youtube so let's talk about going back to the whole nashville thing one of the other things that they we brought back from there was that they said that they simplified the code and if you can make it easier as a developer to build like if you guys as a developer know hey if we go in and we do this we have this intended result and we know that it'll happen does that make sense sure and so they said one of the things they took was i'm, I'm making these numbers up but it was just basically they took like a 300 page book of like what you needed to do to become a development development and they made it like 30 pages <laughs> and it was just they simplified it they just took the out 270 yeah exactly like, yeah. Yeah, just like ah, these ones are garbage yeah right? but but they basically just made it easier so you knew what was coming and i think that we're seeing that in orange county and there's a lot of land leaving Orange County and trying to become annexed into Winter Garden and the city of Orlando, right? Yeah. There's a big announcement that just came out where um, the Church of Latter-day Saints wants to take like, what, 55,000 acres from the unincorporated area of Orange County and move it into the city. I think people don't fully understand what that even means, but as a developer, you probably do. Sure. Well, what, is that, what does that mean to you guys? All right, so, the, you know, there are a couple of things. Haven't developed in numerous, numerous <laughs> states in, in, in America and cities and municipalities. Um, there are some that are, um, you know, it's an interesting one. I would never say they're easier to build in, but the rules are better understood. Right. And the timelines are better understood. And as a developer, and so like, you know, here's one uh, good example out of the state. So I've built a lot in New Jersey and New Jersey is run in townships. Not counties don't have power. Townships have power. Right. And it's like 532 townships. Wow. Right. Um, and some townships are big and really well run and some are not. And, you know, it wasn't necessarily ones are harder to work in or ones are easier to work in. But I think the answer is the rules are set. Yeah. Right. The rules are set. The timeline is set. Um, you know, I think the city of Orlando is very good to work with because, and they're not easy to work with and, you know, but they're good to work with. Sure. And um, they set out the rules, the regulations, the timeline, what, what the expectation is of developers. And I think that uh, as long as we follow it, um, they're very, very reasonable. Um, I think what you're finding right now is, is um, some some counties right and some cities too in florida are struggling with that right they're struggling with the execution of their plan i think some of it is the growth right i mean it's it, hard it, to change the tires on a moving car right <laughs> and so um i think part of it is they're struggling with the growth and you know they're changing their operational plan as they're running at full tilt and that's a very difficult thing to do some do it better than others is it a staffing thing or is um, it a i think you know a little bit um i do think some of the counties and cities that are struggling with it um do have long tenured employees and i think you know, depending on what the cycle is, you could have, you know, people aging out of the job. Um, so I think that too. Um, but, you know, I, I generally, you know, the, I will say this generally in Florida, having developed in numerous states, I would say Florida is a, is a better place to develop in terms of real estate. And that's not the rules that, and it's not, they're easier, they're not the harder, mm -hmm. but they're more, um, they're better understood yeah. and they're more relied on. Yeah. Um, but I think what you're seeing right now is a little bit of, of push and shove in terms of, um, you know, following the rules, following the book, kind of understanding what the next step is. And then, um, I think that's where you see where the church kind of steps in. I mean, listen, I, I would say the church, and they've said this, and I truly believe this, and I see this firsthand, they are great stewards of the land, <laughs> right? Um, not just in Florida, but they're a major landholder throughout the United States. And um, so I, I think that might be what you're seeing come come out. Yeah. Right? And so it's, as a developer, you're not looking for somebody just to rubber stamp absolutely everything. No, it's just understanding not. the rules. Yeah, and, you, and you know, sometimes, some sometimes what you have is a municipality you deal with might might be m more uh, m more open with the rules up front in development and might be actually tougher when it gets to like inspections and things like that sure. but it's still the rules and we know how to follow it and we know how to, and, and we know how to react to it we know how to staff our companies properly yeah. um now are there bad developers of course absolutely yeah totally <laughs> right but um you know i think 
we're fortunate in Central Florida to have a number of developers that have the best interest of the community long term at heart. I think we really do, but I think there are numerous other developers in this area. I mean, I'm on numerous associations at the state level at Central Florida area, and I think we're very fortunate to have a lot of developers that look at it who call it home. Yeah. Right. And so what they're thinking is, how's it going to look for my kids? How's it going to look for my grandkids? Um, so I think we're fortunate in that way. That's awesome. Yeah. So many people are run from Manhattan and then like, you know, don't live here, don't care. They just want to make a buck and then get yeah. out. And I think that's the one cool thing going back to the younger people that live here. There's a lot more, there's a lot less turnover. There's a lot less people that are just coming here and going out, yeah. which I think is healthy for us long term. Like I used to be when I first moved here, you found somebody that lived here or lived here for longer than five years. And it was Oh wow! Like how's yeah, that been? Yeah. And now it's uh, it's more and more more possible, which I think is really cool. Yeah. So there's been some hit pieces out on this whole annexation piece where they're like, well, they just want to move stuff into the city because they wanted to destroy the land. Yeah. Like what? What is that? Is that just? No. Is that simple? No, that's, <laughs> that's not, not the true. answer. Yeah, it's not the truth. So at the end of the day, is that just like it's wild that that could be a news story? Is that just like a hit piece from somebody at the county level, or how does that even come yeah. out? Like, what, where does that come from, other than just bad actors in the past? Well, I, you know, I, I think that. I mean, I honestly feel it probably is a little bit, a bit of bad actors in the past. Listen, mm -hmm. as a career, as a developer for 30 some years, I've seen a lot of bad development, right? Yeah. I've seen, I've seen other developers do things that I'm like, you shouldn't like, that's not legal and you shouldn't do that. And, um, and then I look at, and so I think there's a, le a legacy of that yeah. right? now. But I, you know, I spend a lot of my day with the people that work in the company trying to talk to them about, you know, being a good developer yeah, um, and being a, being a, someone that's going to live here and someone that you're like, when you drive your kids through and your grandkids, through, you should be proud of what you're mm. doing. And I think when you start thinking about that as a developer, um, I think then the, the, the music changes. And uh, so in terms of um, rules between the city and the county, no, I mean, I, you know, listen, I, for Sunbridge specifically. Mm -hmm. um, You're not so low for I, most I of it. Anyways. I would <laughs> challenge anybody to come up with someone who has a better plan to in a, ma a large plan uh, community yep. uh, in the United States that has a better focus on nature than we do. That's so good. Right. Yeah. That's so, so I love it. Yeah. I can't, I'm going to take you up on it. I want to go see the middle of the yeah, land yeah, and see what it all yeah, looks like. Yeah. Uh, so how do you, all right, so here's switching gears a little bit more uh, macroeconomical. So we've got, I, I've been saying soft recession. It feels like a recession. There's like, it's a little tougher today than it was two, three years ago. And so how do you plan for the future when things are just so up and down? I mean, a lot of this stuff is massive capital expenditure where you're doing either infrastructure or big buildings. How do you, how do you stay up with it? Cause I, before you answer, I think about like COVID, like nobody expected COVID to happen and then have the result that we got from COVID here locally anyways, which was massive, quick expansion. Um, how do you even plan for the future on some of these long-term plans that you guys are working on um yeah covid was very interesting right because if you think about it in 20 every in march of 20 everyone thought the economy was going to shut down yeah. and stop everything right. and it did for a while and mm -hmm. then it, it came back crazy especially for this state um you know it's been a challenge you know there there's inflation has been difficult um you know i um it's a little bit of a um uh, it's a little bit of a, a history, you know, when you think about it. So the first house I bought was in 1995 and my interest rate was seven and a quarter. <laughs> and I thought I was winning. Yeah, right? of course. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I think part of it was in the residential world, let's stick to that for a minute. You know, in 2008, which I lived through, um, you know, part of it was uh, banking and everyone knows the story. I mean, it just got out of control, just the deregulation. Uh, the number of homes um, that I would hear about, there were no doc loans. And I would look at it and say, like, you, you, you can't afford this house. Sure. Like, you should not buy this house. <laughs> right. And uh, so that was a unique thing. I think then interest rates got so low that, I mean, my personal belief, and, and this wasn't exactly your question, I feel that and, and then they, they just got uh, unrealistic. And so there was a whole generation that looked at it and said, hold on a minute, my interest rate's not 3% or three and a quarter. Yeah. And so resale stopped, as you know. Mm -hmm. And I think what's got to happen is that interest rate, that 30-year fix, no point rate, probably needs to be about five and a half, mm -hmm. right, ish. And for people to start saying, okay, I'm going to move. I got to have, a, I'm having a baby. I got to get a house. I got to get two bedrooms or, or three bedrooms versus two. So I think that, That'll be the next catalyst, I think, when that happens. And I, I firmly believe it will. In terms of managing costs, um, that's a complicated one. I mean, um, part of it as a developer is getting ready 
you know, it could be a big multifamily project, could be a hotel. It's really getting ready with concept and design and then really understanding costs um, and not expecting revenue to save you, yeah. <laughs> right? So a lot of developers are really kind of some would just bet on, you know, the come, like they're betting on, hey, listen, it's going to be good at the, you know, rents are going to go up, everything's going to be fine. And I think we kind of look at it in a more conservative fashion to say, um, it, you know, that we don't want to get way over our skis. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's a little bit of balance, but you got to be ready. Um, and you got to be ready to go. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, right now, uh, we're, we're starting um, the big lifestyle center where the, the target's going. That's 430,000 square feet of retail. So s part of it is is understanding your cost, understanding your plan, understanding your timeline, and then some of it's luck, <laughs> right? And, and um, yeah. So makes sense. Um, so going back to the target piece, sure. so did you say that was the second, the largest in second quarter? Yeah. So Cornet in Q2, Cornet came out and um, I should know m my work better, but the Cornet came out and said it was the largest retail lease in the United States, Cornet in Q2 of this year. That's crazy. Yeah. And yeah. then uh, I don't know if you saw our, our work on the Hyatt sale. Like, so it, it's a billion dollar sale over an iDrive. It was the largest in the country. Yeah. Yeah. That's the largest commercial. Like that's, you start thinking about like, that's in Orlando. That's yeah. not like yeah. New York or Austin or something. That's, that's here in yeah, our it's own right backyard. Here. It's right here. I would tell you, um, you know, we're there, where we're building this, you know, lifestyle center, it's a big box and kind of a midtown area. I mean, the response from retailers. So everyone, you know, it's interesting for a while there, everybody was just shopping online, but people are coming back out to stores. Yeah. And so the response from, so we have about 410,000 ish square feet of which the targets about 150,000. Yep. Um, we could have it all least today, but as you know, we kind of curate our stuff, yeah, right? You want the Which, right partners. We want the right people there, right? The right tenants there, the right long-term tenants are really additive. And, uh, I think that's the appeal right now. There's a moment in time for Orlando that there are people coming. There is, there is a big desire to be here. You're seeing it on the office side. Listen, the office, it's been office Armageddon in the country, <laughs> right? right yeah. New York, um, San Francisco, D.C. Um, we're okay, right? I mean, listen, is it slower? Absolutely, it's slower. But we have some big, big players still looking at coming in, some mid-sized players coming in. It's still a great place to move your business. So we have that. Industrial has been very strong. Um, the apartment this uh, apartment uh, sector has been strong. Yeah. Part of that is just interest rates, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, the when it's cheaper to rent than buy. It, you're it really rent. is, yeah. and it's it's at a really in my career mm. since the early '90s. It's really an all time gap. You know, historically that might be you know it, it might be like fifteen percent uh, more expensive to own than rent. You know, so that's that's the gap you're seeing. It's like thirty percent. That's a big difference. It's a big, big difference. Yeah. Um, but I, I still believe that you know um, that home home ownership in the America, you know, the American society is really focused on home ownership, and I think it's on developers and builders to really figure out the the you know the the segmented groups and how we kind of appeal to all. Yeah. Right? Can I ask you a personal question? Yeah, yeah. Cool. So as a leader, you're, you've got a lot of people underneath you. You've got restaurants, you've got hotels and residential. There's a lot of people that make Tavistock do what they do. Tell me about that. Like unpack, was that something you were just always drawn to? And how do you manage that many people rowing in the same direction, I guess, is the sure, real quick, quick question. Sure. I mean, um, I like to say, in fact, I just had breakfast with some this morning. I was like, you know, what are you good at? And I'm like, I don't really know if I'm good at anything. But, but I think the one good thing I, I'm really good at is I'm, I'm, I'm good at bringing people together, mm -hmm. right? I'm good at aligning around goals. Um, I'm, I'm good at, um, at this, you know, point in my career and, you know, the number of years I'm, I'm under my belt, I really look at it and say, part of my job is really coaching and mentoring. Um, so I look at our office and we have 24s to, you know, actually what's really interesting is, um, there's a whole generation that left development. Mm. Right. So in 2008, when the downturn hit, everyone left. Right. So there's a segment of of the business now, call it like mm, late 30s to late 40s, that all those people left. Wow. And so um, so we have a lot of young people in the office and I love it. Right. And I love to be told I'm wrong. Right. I mean, I just I just love it. I love the fact that like we have a we have a very, we have an open office. Right. So no one has a, no one has an office. Yeah. You know, I have exactly the same stand up desk that everyone else has in the office. So I'm a firm believer in that. I'm a firm believer in collaboration. I'm, I'm not a believer in titles. I'm a believer that when everyone walks in the room, you should say what you should do, but not your title. 
right? Um, and and I think what you do is more important than than your business yeah, card. Yeah. Um, I'm also a firm believer that the the youngest person that is to our company may have the most important thing to say because their experience is not an anchor, right? They're walking into that oh, room and they're just looking at it and saying, "Why would you look at it this way? Like, why wouldn't we do it differently?" Yeah. Um, that's how I think if you lead like that, right, I think then um, then people come together well. I'm also a firm believer in telling, you know, most of the people that work for me have heard me say this. You know, there are guardrails, like there are decisions to be made within guardrails. More than likely, you are not going to bankrupt the company. Right? <laughs> so depending on what, and you'll know if you're going to get to a decision where it's like, oof, this is a big decision. I need to call in somebody, yeah, right. right? But I firmly believe like empower people, uh, give them that ability. I think really recognize people's efforts, right? Go out of your way to, re- and you do a really nice job, I know, but recognize people effort, people's effort. No one yeah. gets up in the morning thinking I'm going to really, you know, half-ass it today, <laughs> right? You know? Hopefully not. Yeah. Hopefully not. Yeah. People get up and really, really want to make an impact. And I think you need to recognize that effort as well. That's awesome. Yeah. What's one of the things that Tavistock's done that you're like, you know what, I know it's the fiber optics one, you had to figure it out. What's one thing that you guys have done that you're like, interesting, I didn't think we would be in that. But we are. Oh, uh, that's a good question. You know, um, you know, we do have a lot. Uh, this may be not exactly it, but um, we do have a lot of artwork in Lake Nona. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the Lewis family owns a lot of artwork. But we also, um, like I, I've been at a flea market or I've been at like farmer's market and someone's on art and I'll say, hey, you want to come paint a mural? Right. And they'll, be, <laughs> and they'll be like, no. And I'm like, give them my business card. And they're like, okay. Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I never knew we were really going to be that, like, you know, good. Right. Or, you know, in the community mm-hmm. in terms of art of all levels. Right. So, yeah, we do have art that everyone should go see, like uh, some Henry Moore's, a Botero, all of that, you know. Um, but we also have some great artists and that are, I'm, I'm painting, you know, utility boxes yeah. and, and, and painting garages and the artwork that we put even on our buildings. I never thought we were, I was going to be involved in it as much as I am. Um, we have, um, some metal guys that do metal sculptures and I give them ideas and, you know, yeah. we come up with some crazy thing. We have some great ones coming out, really? us, well, like some big, big concept stuff coming out for some of the open area around the wave hotel. Um, I never thought I was going to be that involved in it. I was never thought I was going to love it as much as I do. And I never thought that we'd be kind of good at it. So our goal really is to, uh, through a year, not every week, but we try and put a new piece of artwork every week, like 52 a year. Wow. I mean, so, and, and when you walk around, you feel it, right? It's whether yeah. it's the sculpture garden or just literally the paths in between the yeah. buildings and stuff, it gives it that sense of place and it feels like it's been there for a while and you have some more appreciation yeah. than just like, hey, it's a walkway with lights. Yeah. And nothing's greater than, you know, you go, I, you know, I, I live there, so I walk around all the time and there's nothing greater than like people are Instagram and stuff. Oh yeah. It's a very Instagram <laughs> yeah. little area. That's for darn sure. So what's something you're excited about for the future? Um, you know, <clears throat> I think the, uh, personally or professionally? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm really professionally, uh, I mean, probably there's a, there's a, a fun answer and then maybe a not so fun answer, but I think the fun answer probably is, I'm really excited about the young people that work in the company. Like I just look at their faces every day and I look at how engaged they are. And I think first of all, how lucky I am to be there. Um, But second of all, like they've been able to do amazing things in their career so early. Mm. And I wish in many ways I'd had that chance and I didn't. So I want to make sure they do profession. Like professionally, I, I look at it and say, I think, you know, we have a great opportunity uh, in Lake Nona in terms of some of the development we have on the near fo- near horizon. And in the developer's world, that's four or five years. Yeah. But, um, but in some of the town center work that we have planned, like I think it's going to be great. And I think it'll be, I think we have the opportunity to to add to the city of Orlando to really, to help, you know, the city, you know, to continue to contribute to the city of Orlando and also really, um, you know, set the stage for um, the United States and, and what we can do here. And um, so I'm really excited about that, you know. Per, on a personal level, my, my girls graduated, so I'm so excited to see them and grow and, you know, they're, they're 23 next month. Oh, and man. 
they both got jobs in New York because every kid wants to go to New York. <laughs> of course, they're living in my place, but um, but the uh, you know it's great to see that you know, yeah. and I, and that's it's a lot of fun to see. Man, so. well, as somebody who's a massive proponent of what's going on here in Orlando, I appreciate all the work you guys are doing. Thanks for hanging out. All right, brother. I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Craig. I learned a lot about what's going on in the area and kind of thinking through the ways that Orlando is growing. I'm very excited. Make sure you hit the subscribe button before you leave. We'll see you guys on the next video. Thank you.